So today, we're gonna to be visiting a part of downtown Los Angeles just jam-packed with history. It's a place that will not only introduce one of the many cultures in the city, but will also pose the question, what is it to be an American? Because today, we're gonna to go day tripping in Los Angeles's Little Tokyo. This trip will begin at the Japanese American National Museum and will run a loop through the heart of Los Angeles' Little Tokyo, and it's approximately 1.5 to 2 miles. To get to the start of this trip, review the metro map and take the gold line to the Little Tokyo Arts District Station. Or from the red line, you can exit the Civic Center Grand Park Station and head down First Street. The history of Little Tokyo begins in 1886, when a sailor from Japan opened the Japanese restaurant on East First Street. It wasn't long before a small community of first-generation immigrants from Japan were firmly established in the area. After a population boom caused by the settling of Japanese immigrants recruited to lay tracks for the Pacific Electric Railway in 1903, and thousands who fled the racial tensions in San Francisco after the 1906 earthquake, the area became known as Little Tokyo. These Japanese immigrants succeeded in carving out an economic and social niche in Southern California, and soon began raising their own families. These second-generation Japanese-American children were referred to as Nisei, and they were American citizens by birth and able to vote in elections and own property. When Little Tokyo began to feel the financial pressures of the Great Depression, the English-speaking Nisei became a sought-after revenue source, so community leaders organized a Nisei Week. It was hoped that this would help foster a link between the Japanese community and white America. Now, no nation can claim uh, history uh, free of controversy and the United States is no exception. Um, we certainly have stains on our history books and skeletons in our closet, uh, especially when it comes to issues of race relations and civil rights. Even today, we're still having the debate over uh, what is it to be an American and who gets to have that privilege. Well, back during World War II, the Japanese American community, they had to come face to face with that question in a very direct and forceful way. By the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor, there were over 30,000 Japanese Americans living in Little Tokyo, and well over 100,000 living up and down the west coast of the United States. On February 14, 1942, fear of questionable Japanese American loyalties, compounded by racism, led President Roosevelt to issue Executive Order 9066. This order authorized military commanders to designate military areas from which any and all persons may be excluded. General DeWitt, who was in charge of the defense of the entire West Coast, quickly passed a series of proclamations that would eventually lead to the internment of all people of Japanese ancestry living within 100 miles of the West Coast. Over 110,000 Japanese Americans were ordered to report to assembly areas where they were given identification tags, loaded onto buses, and sent off to one of the many camps located throughout the United States. Officially, these locations were called internment camps, but many today feel that we should drop the euphemism and call them what they were, concentration camps. You can learn all about the Japanese concentration camps right here at the Japanese American National Museum. In 1992, the Japanese American National Museum opened its doors to shed light on the Japanese American experience and to safeguard the rich oral histories, artifacts, photographs, written records, and other materials documenting the lives of Japanese Americans. This is one of my favorite museums in town. Uh, I come here quite often. Uh, they have a really great standing exhibit which goes over the history and culture of uh, Japanese American immigrants, uh, not only in California, but in the United States. Uh, but they were mostly out west, and it goes over like all the challenges they had of just, you know, settling in and, and owning land and uh, becoming a U.S. citizen. And then it goes into the whole uh, World War II period where uh, that citizenship and their, their very loyalty, their very loyalty uh, was, was put into question uh, and how they reacted to that. And they also really have some great um, uh, touring uh, exhibits which come through here. Uh, they just recently had one and it's still going on right now as of this video about uh, Hiroshima, which is um, really powerful. Just across the plaza from the Japanese American National Museum, you'll see the original Hompa Hongwaji Buddhist Temple. So it was right here behind me at the, uh, the Buddhist Temple, the Buddhist Shrine, uh, that the Japanese citizens were asked to um, gather and get on the buses to, uh, to go off to the camps. Um, 
there's a famous picture of the buses lined up here with soldiers and uh, all these people with their luggage uh, and the thing is they put these little tags on them uh, so everybody was like tagged and identified the whole experience had to be uh, quite well not quite but really demeaning you know to ask to to leave your home uh, be get a number and uh, get on a bus and head off to well, they had no idea where they're heading off to, uh, but they were essentially giving up their lives. Right next door to the Buddhist temple, you'll find the Go For Broke Museum. This museum opened its doors in 2015. Their mission is to educate and inspire character and equality through the virtue and valor of our World War II American veterans of Japanese ancestry. So it's really fitting that they open this Go For Broke education center here. Um, and it's got this exhibit in there called Defining Courage Exhibit. Uh, and it asks you, it's a, it's a hands-on exhibit, and it asks you or poses the question, like, what would you do uh, in their situation uh, where your rights are being taken away, uh, where you were being distrusted, and where you were asked to, like, you know, give up your home uh, and, and, and leave because um, you might be an enemy to the very country that you've been living in. So between the Japanese American National Museum and the Go For Broke Educational Center, there's this alleyway here. And if you take that down to the end, uh, you'll find the Go For Broke Monument. Dedicated in 1999, it honors the Japanese Americans who fought and served in World War II. And the important thing to remember is these were guys who our country and our government were saying um, should be trusted. Uh, the 100th Infantry Battalion, uh, the ones that was there uh, at Pearl Harbor uh, and they suffered the Japanese bombing and as a matter of fact they were the first ones to capture a, a Japanese prisoner of war <laughs> as well as they captured a Japanese submarine. They had their guns taken away from them. They were rounded up, uh, they were sent on a ship and they were secretly moved into the middle of the United States uh, just because nobody knew what to do with them and they didn't know if they could trust them to fight. And then the 442nd, well that was comprised of volunteers but volunteers from the concentration camps. Uh, these were people that had their rights taken away, had their homes taken away, were put into camps, uh, surrounded by barbed wire and guns, and then volunteered to fight for the country. And not only did they fight, but they became one of the most decorated unit in U.S. military history. As you can see, Major General Willoughby here, MacArthur's intelligence chief, he wrote, The Nisei saved countless lives and shortened the war by at least two years. Another quote here is by President Truman. He writes, you fought not only the enemy, you fought prejudice and won. To learn more about the 100th Infantry Battalion and the 442nd, you can check out some links I've left in the description below. Now that you know the history of the Japanese-American experience, it's time to enjoy the culture. From the museums, head up First Street and you come to the heart of Little Tokyo's dining and shopping district. First Street is lined with restaurants, many of which will often have lines of people just waiting to get in. You're kind of walking through two worlds here. All these buildings back here, um, there are a lot of them are the original pre-war buildings uh, that were around uh, this area. Today they serve as restaurants and hotels and, and the like. What they've done here is on the streets as you're walking around, if you look down, there are plaques on the streets here to tell you what these buildings were pre-war uh, before people had to give up their businesses. Crossing the street, you enter Little Tokyo Village. You know you're there when you see the giant red watchtower. You can wander through the Japanese village enjoying a variety of shops and dining options. From ramen to sushi to shabu shabu to pizza, there's something for everyone. So my new favorite place down here is called Shinchikorin, um, and they serve something called okonomiyaki. Okonomiyaki is a form of Japanese street food that became popular in Hiroshima. Today you'll find okonomiyaki served all over Japan, and it's slowly making its way into parts of the U.S. You can also stop by Mitsuru Cafe and watch them make red bean cake right in the window. If you time it right, you'll get them warm and fresh off the oven, and they taste just like a pancake covered with maple syrup. After you've done your tour of the Little Tokyo Village, go out to 2nd Street and make a right. Go down, cross over San Pedro Street, and you'll find a road heading off at an angle. This is astronaut Ellison Onizuka Street. I remember exactly where I was when the Challenger exploded. Uh, I was in middle school. The science teacher told us all to sit down and be quiet uh, because of the accident. Born in Hawaii, Ellison Onizuka was the first Asian-American astronaut to reach space on the space shuttle Discovery. However, he lost his life, along with seven other astronauts, during the explosion of the space shuttle Challenger. The interesting thing about this street is, from what I understand, is that it was an original path from the harbor uh, where people would come in on the ships, you know, this is before trains and all that stuff, and they would hire coaches to take them to uh, 
Los Angeles, which was, you know, located down there over near Olvera Street and stuff. Uh, the thing was, these coaches were typically run by young guys. You know, it was kind of like, you know, the hot rods of the day. And uh, people would pay more for them to race. So they would come down and they would race from the, the harbor all the way downtown. And this is one of the streets uh, through which those carts would uh, be racing. So these kids were probably riding with like some abandoned, uh, whooping and cheering as their horses came plowing through here. So uh, not only will you get to see, um, you know, a cool little side street here in Los Angeles, uh, you'll get to see a memorial for the Challenger and uh, you'll get to uh, walk along a little bit of Los Angeles history. In the nearby shopping mall on the second floor, you'll find Kino Kunia. This is a Japanese bookstore chain founded in 1927. One of the company's goals has been to cater to the interests of not only local Japanese clients, but to a wider, more diverse clientele. Kino Kunia is the largest bookstore chain in Japan, and it has more than 80 stores around the world. So as usual, I couldn't cover everything there is to see and do down in this area here. Uh, there's like a lot of little shops to go check out. There's a lot of restaurants uh, you can eat at, but um, you can really spend all day just wandering around this area, uh, going into these alleyways, checking out statues, uh, seeing murals. Or if you just want to continue past the little Tokyo Village area, you can cross Second Street and continue down uh, this plaza here to the Japanese American Community Center. And then just beyond that, there's another war memorial. And then if you just keep going down that way, you'll go to the Toy District. Uh, and there's always some fun things to see down there. Or you can come out of the village, make a left and continue down to Central. Just go over Central and there's the Angel City Brewery. So you can stop there for a beer when you're done with your trip. So yeah, you can spend a whole day down here. So thanks for watching and uh, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future day trips. And until then, uh, remember to try to get out and stay safe.